The time for our gospel meeting is upon us. It will begin next Sunday. Uh, Brother John West will be, of course, doing the preaching. Thus, we can be assured that the gospel will be preached. Uh, Brother West is going to do his part in the proclamation of the gospel. But what about us? Uh, gospel meeting have their place in, even in our world today. The wis in the wisdom of God, a plan was made, and in that plan, God provided for the preaching of the gospel. In 1 Corinthians, the first chapter in verse 21, Paul would state, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. God set forth a plan. It included, of course, the death of His Son, Jesus the Christ. It includes the church and every aspect of the church. But it also includes the aspect of preaching the gospel. Because that's the way that God has set forth that man is to believe and thus be saved. When it is done as God intended, it will be successful. Thus, I want us this morning and this afternoon to think of our gospel meeting that's coming up as a challenge. First, it is a challenge to our faith in the power of the gospel. We know the passages, no doubt, that teach about the fact that the gospel is God's power to save. Romans 1, 16 and 17, "...for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ." For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God uh, revealed from faith to faith, that is, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Here in the passage that we began with in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 18, Paul would write, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us that are saved it is the power of God. He would repeat that same idea a few verses later, verse 23 and 24, when he says, But we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews, a stumbling block. Under the Greeks, foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jew and Gentile, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. There's the preaching of the cross and the cr fact that the cross is, while a stumbling block or foolishness to many, it is the power of God. James 1 and verse 21 he says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. And receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. The gospel is that engrafted or that implanted word is able to save our souls. We know that theoretically. We know that the Bible teaches that. But I wonder how many times we actually believe it. Do we really believe that the gospel is God's power to save? Now, I know the religious world doesn't. A lot of those that have Church of Christ on the building no longer believe that it's God's power to save because they've left off preaching of the gospel to preaching good, nice after-dinner speeches that makes everyone feel good and go home satisfied, supposedly. But do we really believe that the gospel is God's power to save? Do we have the real belief within us that the gospel of Jesus Christ has the power to change people, to change lives? 
Saul is a good illustration. Uh, Saul of Tarsus, here he was, a persecutor of the church. Hated the church with such passion that he would go to the high priest and get letters from him to go as far as to Damascus to find anyone who is a Christian and bring them back to Jerusalem to be put to death. Surely the gospel could not have power on that individual's life. But yet, we find that it does. Galatians 1, 23, Paul says, For they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now, <coughs> now preacheth the faith which he once destroyed. He destroyed the church. He destroyed the faith. But the gospel had a power to change his life so that he went from being a persecutor to being one who was persecuted. Again, he would write in 1 Timothy, the first chapter, in verse 13, concerning himself that he was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. And he says, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. If he... As he later, or as he also describes himself as the chiefest of sinners, if the gospel was able to change his life, don't we realize that the gospel can change anyone's life? Are there people in the world today who we just feel like, well, the gospel won't do them any good? It's no use going to preach to that individual to try to teach him. It's not going to do him any good. You know, brethren, in a, it is really an indication that we don't believe in the power of the gospel. That it really does have the power to change people's lives. If we don't have a true belief that the gospel today, preached in its purity and in its plainness, has the ability to change a person's life, then we might as well not have the gospel meeting that we're going to have. We might as well close this building up and never come here anymore and just forget about it all. If we don't have that true belief that the gospel has the power to change people's lives... If we don't have that true belief that the gospel is able to change people and to save people from their sins, then we're defeated before we even begin. How in the world can we expect anyone to come and hear that gospel if we don't even believe it has the power to affect their lives, to save their souls? And so... Yes, this meeting is a challenge. It's a challenge to us to believe the gospel and to believe that it is the power of God to save mankind. That it is powerful enough to move men to give up their sin and to serve a living God. But in order for us to really believe that, and to act upon it, we have to get people a chance to hear the gospel. And that, invi that means inviting people to come and listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ being preached. And to that end, of course, that means that we as individuals go out talking to others, our friends, our neighbors to invite them to come and hear God's Word. And so, not only is a gospel meeting a challenge to our belief in the gospel and its power, it's also a challenge to each and every one of us, every member of the Lord's church, to work. 
I dare say we recognize the principle that unless we do some work, we're not going to succeed. And nothing will succeed without work. It's just an impossibility. Take a business. If you're not going to work at the business, you're doomed to fail. It's going to go bankrupt. Take a sporting endeavor. You, know, you look at uh, baseball, even before the season starts, what do they have? They have spring training in which they go someplace and they start training. Why? Because they recognize it takes work to be successful. Nothing succeeds without work. In 1 Corinthians 15th chapter, Paul talks about the resurrection, proves that we will be raised because Christ was raised. But he concludes that chapter in verse 58 by saying, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. always abounding in the work of the Lord. There is a work to be performed, a work that God has given us that we are to abound in, and we are always abound in it. It's not just something that we do Sunday morning and maybe Sunday afternoon and maybe Wednesday night. No, this is an opportunity that we have to come and worship God. It's certainly not our work. Our work is preaching and saving souls. Our meeting that we're going to have starting next week, as anything else in life, will not succeed unless we work it. Doing our job, our work, in that gospel meeting. I have no doubts that Brother West is going to do his work in preaching the gospel, doing it in its purity, in its plainness, in sincerity and love for both God, the Word, and mankind. But his working and doing his job is not going to do our job for us. We've got to get out and get to work. We've drifted into thinking many times <clears throat> that a meeting can be successful by maybe running an ad in the newspaper, maybe on television, maybe making a few announcements, putting it up on the sign, and then everything will be working out well for the meeting. Now, these things need to be done if they can be done. But those things will never take the place of each and every one of us getting out and doing something. Each and every one of us working for the accomplishing of the good of the preaching of the gospel during this gospel meeting effort. If we don't do our work, the meeting is going to fail. And if a meeting is not worth working for, it's really not worth having, is it? If we're not willing to work for this meeting, then why have it? Again, why not just lock the doors and just close up the building sell the property and whatever goes with it if we're not willing to do our part, if we're not willing to put forth an effort. It's the job of each and every member of this congregation to work in the Lord's vineyard. That's our vocation. That's our job. What we do in the week, 
our job is being out there as a representative of Christ, not as an, as an ambassador, as the apostles were the ambassadors, but we are representing Christ to a world. Thus, we need to be out working for Him. That's our job. Everything else is secondary. And when we fail to work... When we fail to do our job, then we are shirking our responsibility. Our responsibility before God and before a lost and dying world. Then a gospel meeting is also a challenge to our interest. Our meeting is going to show where our heart is. I hope uh, as you, if you don't go in and out the doors out there, go that way and look at the bulletin board. Nancy put a new bulletin board up uh, this week. Excellent job that she did. We appreciate her for that. It wasn't necessarily for the meeting, but it does present the very idea that I'm trying to set forth at this point in time. That a gospel meeting is a challenge to our interest. What are our priorities? Where is our heart? In Matthew 6, Jesus would state in verse 21, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Well, where is our heart? Because this is really what's going to separate the sheep from the goats. As Jesus uses the illustration uh, multiple times in the Scriptures. Which one are we? Where's our interest? Where do we spend our time? Where do we spend our efforts? Where do we spend our money? Where do, where's our heart? What do we talk to others about? When was the last time we talked to somebody about their soul salvation? When was the last time we talked to somebody and inviting them to come to worship services with us, to invite them to a gospel meeting effort. Jesus said later on in that 6th chapter of Matthew in verse 33 that we are to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. He says, all these things shall be added unto you. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. Now then, what's our duty? Seek first. That's to be our priority in life. Seek first the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God deals with the church. The kingdom of God and His righteousness. That is how we can be in a right relationship with God. What is that? The gospel of Jesus Christ reveals the righteousness of God. Romans 1, 16 and 17. Thus, our duty, our responsibility, that the very first thing, the priority within our life, is the church and the gospel. But is it? Now, there's the old um, cartoon, almost, or statement, that if they tried you for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? It teaches a good lesson because what about the person in the world? What do they see? In the Bible class this morning, it talked about Acts 8 and verse 4 in particular, that they went everywhere preaching the gospel. Paul mentioned uh, Mark, uh, Matthew 28, 18, and, or 19 and 20. Having gone, literally, as you're going, what do you do? Make disciples. 
if the world is looking at your life, at my life, would they say that as we go, we're making disciples? Would they accuse us? That individual, you know, every time I talk to him, he's talking about the gospel. He's talking about the church. Or would it be, well, I didn't know he was Christian. I didn't know that he believed the gospel. I didn't know that he uh, knew anything about it. And see, where are we talk? What are we talking about? Where is our interest really laying? Is it in the things of this world, or is it on spiritual matters? Now, to be a Christian, in all that the idea and all that the word Christian involves, is to be interested in the lost. Remember Jesus' statement to Zacchaeus in Luke 19 and verse 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He would be willing to leave heaven and all of the glories of heaven, equality with the Father, and that eternal aspect of that equality. He was willing to leave that, humble himself, and become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, being found in the fashion of a man. Why? Because he came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's the reason why. That's the very background that we see of Christ leaving heaven was to save souls. Now, to be interested in the lost is to be busy trying to save souls, trying to save the lost. Now you look at the life of Jesus. And while he went about helping people and giving aid and comfort to them and performing miracles of healing and other types of miracles, it was all done in the background of teaching the gospel to them and bringing them to repentance, to obey the gospel, to obey God's law. the miracles that Jesus performed. I think sometimes we misunderstand. They were never for the purpose. And understand that. They were never for the purpose of helping people. Did they? Yes. But that wasn't the purpose of it. The purpose was to prove his deity, that he was the Christ, and thus the words that he spake were the words of God, and to get people to listen to the message. That's why in relationship to sending out the apostles, he would be able to send them out with that miraculous ability. But what it was the purpose of it? It was not to give aid or to heal people or help them. Again, that's not the purpose of it. That was a byproduct of it. But the purpose of it was to confirm the word. Mark 16, verse 20, and Hebrews 2, verse 4. To confirm the word which they were preaching and teaching, and thus... As they went out, yes, even in that miraculous ability, the purpose of it was for the preaching of the truth. What is that? That's the gospel. Why? Because they knew that that miracle that they performed on that occasion, while it might heal the sick, it might give aid and comfort to certain people, it had no power other than the physical, and the eternal was what was important. And so they went out with a message, and that message is that which was important. And so as they went, they went preaching the gospel. That's what we're to do. That's our interest. 
We need to have an interest in the lost, yes, in being busy trying to save them. Our gospel meeting gives us an opportunity to be interested in the lost. To talk to that individual in the world and invite them to come and hear the gospel preached. To talk to that person who's lost and dying in sin. Get them to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That power of God to save their soul. That person who's going to die and spend an eternal torment to get that individual to realize his sin and thus repent and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ in being baptized for the remission of his sins. Our meeting gives us that opportunity to go out and do that, to invite them to hear that gospel preached. There's something wrong with a person's heart that claims to be a Christian and is not interested in a gospel meeting. If you're not interested in a gospel meeting, there's something wrong with your heart. You need to look at yourself and examine yourself whether you're in the faith, as Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. A Christian, and I mean that in every sense of the term, a Bible term, is going to be interested in every service. You're going to be interested in the singing of the songs of praise unto God. You're going to be interested in the prayers that are prayed, saying amen at the giving of thanks. Going to be interested in meeting those who are visitors. May I say that our responsibility of mem- as members of this congregation, when the final amen is stated, is not to talk to one another. It's a great opportunity for us to visit, yes. But our first and foremost thing should be in saying hello to our visitors meeting them and making them feel welcome, creating a friendly atmosphere, a place where they want to come back and hear the gospel preached again. Talking to them about their soul salvation, encouraging them to give heed to what has been stated and what has been heard, the preaching of the gospel and their obedience to it of encouraging those who have fallen back into the world who might have been one time faithful Christians to return to the fold, to save their soul. Yes, as James puts it in James 5, 19 and 20. It's our responsibility to restore such a one. The spirit of meekness, Galatians 6 and verse 1. That's our responsibility And that's the first thing that we need to be interested in in saying of amen at the close of each service. Making sure that those visitors feel welcome. Make sure that those individuals who may be a backslidden want to come back. You're not interested in those things. Then maybe you need this meeting so that you can be converted. But then, fourth, a gospel meeting is a challenge to our influence in the community and with others. What type of influence do you have in your neighborhood, the street upon which you live? Or maybe we might uh, make it uh, countywide in Escambia County. In 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, Paul states to the Corinthians, Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men, that men were looking at them and seeing them. Now then, what are they reading? What are they seeing? That goes back to what we were saying a few minutes ago. The person in the world. 
what would they say about our life? Would they produce enough evidence to convict us of being a Christian, of being interested in their soul's salvation? Would they produce enough evidence to say this person's guilty of teaching the gospel to each and every person he comes in contact with? What do they know and read about you and your life? What do they know and read about your influence, your interest? You're going to be here at these services every time the door is open? Or would they know and read something else, that something else takes priority within your life? Jesus stated in Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 13 through 16, that ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt hath, hath lost his Savior, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but, but to be cast out and trodden underfoot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. What is it you're to be an influence to others, to the people around you, to the world around you? Paul changed the wording of that song from send the light to take the light. And in the second verse, it talks about, I've heard the Macedonian call today. The song has sin the light. The problem is, Paul heard a, the Macedonian call, that's who it was referring to, and he went and took it. If we're hearing the Macedonian call, what is Macedonian call? It stands representatively for individuals who are lost who need the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's our responsibility to go and take it to them. What's our influence, though, in relationship to the world, to people who see us? Is it one of taking the light unto them? Or have we lost our Savior, our flavor, our saltiness? If we've lost that saltiness, what is it? We're good for nothing but be to cast out and be trodden underfoot of men. In other words, we're worthless. If we've lost our influence among people. Paul would tell his son in the faith, Timothy, in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 12, To let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word and conversation and charity and spirit and faith and purity are we really that example of the believers are we example of the believers in the power of the gospel to save mankind are we example of the believers and the way in which we speak in our actions, in our interest, in our lifestyle. Now that's what Paul is saying to Timothy. You be an example of the believers, but he's also saying it to us. We are to be examples of the believers. Now then, as people look at your life, is your life such that would hinder someone from coming to our gospel meeting or would it encourage them to come? Now which one is it? There's really no in between. You're either encouraging them one way or the other by the life that you live, by the interests that you show by your attendance at all of the worship services of the church, by the way in which you talk, or you're influencing them either to come to the gospel meeting or to stay away from it. Now, 
Now then, if we're not able to influence them to the, come to the gospel meeting by the lifestyle that we live, then, brethren, that's a sad commentary on our life as a Christian. It's, it's really impossible to think of one living like the Bible teaches us to live. Teaching us to live as a Christian is to be in every aspect of life and not being able to influence anyone along spiritual matters. A Christian is going to influence them in spiritual matters first and foremost. And yes, that can include coming to our gospel meeting starting next week. And so, in many respects, this gauges our influence with the people that we know and that we see and how much influence we possess. Talk to them. Encourage them to come. That's what it's going to take on each and every person's part. But also, it means that we're going to have to be a Christian and all that that means. I'm going to have to live the Christian life. I'm going to have to be doing what God wants me to do. And obeying the gospel, yes, initially, through our faith, repenting of our sins, making a confession of our faith, and being baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. If you don't do that, how can you influence anyone else to obey the gospel? If I'm not doing it myself, but then living as Christians should in every aspect of our life. And if you're not living that type of lifestyle that you're going to influence others to obey the gospel, to become a Christian, then why not change your life this morning so that you can influence those around you, those family members, those who live in your area and see you, those that you work with, those that you associate with, live starting today, if you have not been, in a way that will influence them to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if there is sin within your life that is of a public nature, Repent this morning and let us pray with you for the forgiveness of your sins. And come back into Him. God is ready to forgive any and every sin that we might ever commit if we will repent of it and ask Him for the forgiveness. And He is willing to receive us back and to give us a home with Him in heaven throughout all eternity. If you need to come this morning, we would encourage you to do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.